Hi, I'm Bren Antrim, a librarian here at Santa Monica College Library. Today I'm going to be talking about AI-assisted research. This workshop is licensed under the Creative Commons license uh, BYNC 4.0, which means it can be reused, repurposed, um, um, free of charge, with attribution. Today's workshop will cover a number of things, um, including a short history and explanation of generative AI using ChatGPT as an example, of an AI-assisted search using the program Kenius, and the hybrid of these, which is a generative search program such as Bing, Bard, or the search generative experience from Google. This is being recorded in October of 2023. So please keep that in mind. Um, all of this information is subject to change because it is rapidly developing. The workshop will be a comparison of ChatGPT and AI-assisted search specifically after we discuss these things, and a sample search in ChatGPT that shows um, finding a prompt, brainstorming a topic, and using search terms. We'll talk quickly about the Office Suite, which is available for Santa Monica College students, and using the Kenius app in Word using the brainstorming that we did with ChatGPT in a document in Kenius to find journal articles. So it all builds on the um, beginning with the generative AI, heading into the Word app, heading into the document search. Today's workshop will not cover how instructors che check for cheating, although Please keep in mind that any usage that is not cited is plagiarism, whether it comes from a journal article or ChatGPT. I'm not going to get into the nuts and bolts of how AI work. I'm not a coder or a programmer. I'm a librarian. I use the tool. I don't build it. We won't talk about what impact AI will have in the future or tomorrow because it's changing quickly. Sadly, my crystal ball is broken. And we will not talk about whether your instructor allows you to use it in the classroom or not. At this time, there is no comprehensive um, policy about AI use, and I don't believe there will be any time soon, in part because the tool is changing rapidly. Access to the tool is changing or will be in the future, and that's an equity issue. And how AI is used in various disciplines is different. How you use an AI as a tool in English versus how you use it in chemistry versus how you use it in business are very, very different. Um, so that is all under development. The one thing I will tell you as a student, always ask. It's better to ask and make sure that what you're doing is within the purview and the allowance of your assignment than do all the work and then find out that you're not allowed to use a specific tool. Which leads to uh, don't plagiarize. Quotations um, should be cited any time that you paraphrase work, that you use the work created by another person or computer being. Um, you need to make sure that you cite it. But I'm not going to dig deeply into that because that's like a half an hour on its own. However, if you take a picture of the two links that are on your screen, the Modern Language Association and the American Psychological Association are the two main citation format groups that we use at Santa Monica College, and they do have posts up on their website for how to correctly cite generative AI, whether it's ChatGPT or, or Perplexity AI or one of the others, um, using their format. Please note, this workshop is intended for students doing research using AI tools. It is not intended for instructors. Instructors and others are welcome, of course, but it is aimed at students doing research. And the information is from my perspective as a librarian, not a computer scientist, and it's intended for practical application to research. Okay. So let's start with an analogy to get into the mindset. How is AI like a car? Well, AI has been around for a long time, over 75 years. And cars, like AIs, have been developing for a long time, and the newest iteration is complex and can be confusing. Now, with a car, as a driver, I don't need to know how the systems work. But a mechanic does. Just like with AI, a data scientist and programmer needs to know how all the systems work. But the researcher doesn't. 
We don't need to know how to decode neural networks in order to use the AI. What we do need to know, whether we're driving a, a car or using ChatGPT, is how to do it effectively and ethically for the safety of ourselves and others. And that safety is metaphorical when it comes to AI, literal when it comes to cars, because we are trying to do the best research that we can and putting it out for others to learn from. And if we use information irresponsibly or unethically, not only does that leave us open to charges of plagiarism, but it also means that the information that we put out is not good. And you want your work to be good and to be useful. Um, and then there's the actual literal overlap where cars use AI and everything from collision alert systems to self-driving. So there's an overlap there too. So the first question that often springs to mind when talking about our artificial intelligence is how does AI think? Well, it doesn't. It uses a neural network at this point in its development anyway. Information comes in disaggregated, disaggregated, large batch information is fed into the system and it goes through a series of decision making points in this neural network. It follows certain logic or rules and those are the algorithms that they apply to this data. And it scans and looks for patterns and matches those patterns, completes those patterns with disaggregated data over and over and over and over again. And that creates the output that we see as a conversation that we're having with this program, but it's not really a conversation. So um, the more advanced it becomes, the deeper the learning is. So that's what they talk about deep learning. Is it the computer program interprets the training data gets feedback, reinterprets it, gets more feedback from the user or from the human trainer, sends it back through the process over and over and over again. And that's that deep training. So in essence, they get incredibly large sets of data. And in the, set, in the case of generative AI as it is right now, they're getting that data via open sources. And because they never have to go to the bathroom and they never have to go to sleep, they just keep refining their performance over and over and over again. Um, because they are trained on open sources, there are implications about that data. Where does it come from? It comes from people who have access and authorship on the open web that cuts out certain segments of the population so their voices are not heard. It is very predominantly white male academic and white and hobbyist. So there are inherent biases in this data that it's using that then must come out in the content because whatever you put in is, is refined based on what that content is and that's the result that you get. So the things that we need to be worried about a little bit are, um, or a lot, are what does the data actually contain that it's being used to train on? And what are the inherent slants, biases, and absences within that data? And then the second part is who is deciding that? What is their motivation? And that hasn't really been talked about very much because it is proprietary software. It's really hard to get any sort of answers or any sort of transparency from the people who are building and configuring this. And we need to be wary of that because you always, in Harry Potter, there was a line of about never trust something if you don't know where it keeps its brain. In this case, it's be wary of something that gives you information when you don't know where that information comes from. That said, I don't want people to be afraid of artificial intelligence. I want people to approach it with questions, with curiosity, with critical evaluation. I don't want them to approach it with fear because it's already woven throughout our lives. We live with it on a daily basis. Every time we use a spell checker, every time we do a search, every time we start our engine in our car, every time we use Siri or Alexa, every time we use the, the smart lights in our house. So it's already woven into our lives and it is a very powerful and useful tool. 
So I want us to approach it questioningly, but not with fear, never with fear. And when I talk about emotions with AI, that leads us to the big elephant in the room, which is the fact that as humans, when we are talking with something that is talking back to us, we tend to think of it as a human. We anthropomorphize it, or we, we try to turn it into a person, which has some real drawbacks, especially when dealing with AI. And as a person who has named my car, I have a real problem with this. Um, I talk to my computer all the time. I think we all do. We all sort of yell at our phone every once in a while. But what this does with AI is this leads us to overestimate what AI can do. We even talk about how AI thinks or creates. It doesn't do either of those things. It scans data and it matches patterns. That is not thinking or creating in the way that humans do it. So at least as of October of 2023, this is a misnomer. This is a problem and a mistake that we make. This also leads us to trust it more than we should and ignore the humans and the motivations behind it. Um, we tend to see AI as being somehow better than us. It doesn't have the same failures that humans do. Well, not in the same way, but it is driven by humans, trained by humans, and fed data that is made by humans. So all of those human pitfalls are built into the programming, are built into the data sets, and then are therefore built into the answers that you get from it. And we tend to get attached to it. I have found myself having conversations with AI and kind of forgetting that there's not a person on the other end of that conversation. And this is a slippery slope. So we have to be aware of that. They are not sentient. So with those caveats in mind, um, let's dive into the real content of this workshop, which is generative versus search AI and the difference. So I asked ChatGPT, what would you tell me the difference between a generative AI, an AI-assisted search engine, and a hybrid search engine such as Google Bard? And take a look at this question. This is a really specific question. There have been a lot of comments lately and a lot of training about prompt construction. Librarians have been doing this for 200 years. We call us the reference interview. And what it is, is it's trying to ensure that the question is clear enough and precise enough to get the answers that are needed without being so broad that there's information overload. So this is a specific but long question because it is giving the computer sorry about that, computers, it is giving the computer um, a pattern to follow and the more parameters you give it for that pattern, the closer it comes to matching it. So you'll notice I'm asking for um, differences and similarities. So it's giving me a breakdown for each one so that I can look at the nature of each, examples of each, use cases, etc. So I can literally compare them side by side. And what all of this boils down to is generative AI creates new patterns based on the pattern that you give it in your question. An AI assisted search finds specific resources based on the unique search terms within your question. So generative AI is tailored toward your pattern. You can reiterate the question, change it a little bit. It will respond to that change and give you more specific content because it's getting a better pattern to follow. AI assisted search will give the same result no matter who does the search because it's not looking at you, it's looking at your question and it's looking at the unique key terms within that question and any limiters that are put on that search. A hybrid search engine, meanwhile, something like BARD or Bing or SGE, does not combine both. So hybrid is a bit of an iffy question on this. Rather, it builds it. First, it gives you a generative AI response, and then it gives you a list of specific resources. So it does both searches and just puts both on the page for you. It does not actually combine the search. So we'll look at four specific areas 
where there are differences between Gen AI, Gen AI, AI assisted search engines and hybrid search engines. The difference between interactivity and passive search, which I just mentioned some outcomes of that just a moment ago. The quality and quantity of the information that you get. The purpose of the tool, assistance in learning versus retrieval of information. And lastly, the skills that are required to deal with an AI search. So the first of these is interactivity versus a passive search. Any generative AI is interactive and conversational. That is its pattern. Search engines return specific resources. So a generative AI cannot tell you, I got this information from this journal article because all of the data within its search is disaggregated. If you think of it like a jar full of information, the jar has been emptied and all of the information is floating in a big pool of other information. Meanwhile, a search engine goes and finds that jar and hands you the jar. So when you ask ChatGPT, where did you get this? It might give you some websites, but it will not give you journal articles because it doesn't know them. It can't connect that content to that container. The search engine, meanwhile, can just hand you the journal article. But if you say something about, um, you know, how is this related to my topic? The search engine will say, it has your search term in it. <laughs> Bink. Generative AI is really good at simplifying complex topics. So if I say I'm doing a paper that involves a component on economics, and my master's degrees are in information science and communication critical studies, neither one is economics. So I don't really know what the journal article is saying. I can put the abstract and the results, not the whole paper because it chokes, but I can put like the conclusion and the abstract into ChatGPT and say, Tell me what this means at a high school senior level. And it will read it and give me that result. So I can determine whether it's worth taking the time to decode this journal article in this discipline I'm not familiar with, or if it's really not applicable to my topic and I can skip it and go to the next one. So that's really helpful. Search engines return specific resources. So if I want to know where my information comes from, I need to get journal articles because I'm in an English one class and I'm required to use academic research for this paper. The generative AI is not going to help me, but the search engine is going to be here. You're in this database. It's all scholarly journal articles. They've already been looked at. Here's some things that you can evaluate and determine if they're useful for your research. Very big difference. Um, and the search engines give data but don't give any context around that so they just hand you that journal article anything that uses generative ai uses the question to get closer and closer to the pattern when it gives you their answer so that means that it tailors results to individual users based on prior interactions this improves relevancy and efficiency whereas the search the more specific your search term, the better your results will be, but that's because it's a new search, not because, not because it's building on prior questions. And of course, because it's what they do, they do patterns. Generative AI and hybrid search engines interact, so it's a dynamic search process. Um, whereas with a search engine, you have to look at the results, determine what's appropriate, and then search further or more deeply on those appropriate results. The quality and quantity of information also varies. Search engines are live, so they will go out and find that newspaper article that was published today on that news that happened this morning. Various AIs have various cutoff dates. This allows them to um, do a human reinforced training for things like appropriateness. So for example, after ChatGPT goes through and, and does all of its internal training, it also has humans check its information. So if it's giving results that are racist or misogynist or um, offensive, like those aren't, but you know, specifically offensive, the human trainer can say, this is incorrect response and this is why. And then the program will go, oh, okay, so those are patterns that are not appropriate and it will stop giving those patterns as a response. But they have to have some time to work on that 
So their cutoff date is January 2022 for ChatGPT4. This is the paid program. ChatGPT 3.5, I believe, is a little bit um, actually earlier than that. Um, talked about it a little bit, but search engines offer specific sources and offer more sources, while generative AI provides in-depth explanations separate from specific sources. And it can synthesize information from various sources, but it can't tell you where it got that information because of the fact that it's using disaggregated huge amounts of floating data, basically. And this is the kicker. Search engines give the same results to everyone. They use metadata, which is the sort of hidden or invisible data that surrounds a web page that tells um, the coding that tells about that, that web page. And it uses the content of web pages in order to give you that result. And that result is often tailored for marketing because the metadata often includes terms that are used for marketing. Generative AI models um, do really well with complex queries because they recognize patterns and they can use that iteration, that back and forth um, with their questioner to become more and more specific to the individual's question, to their individual need. The third thing on the list is the, the purpose of the tool. Um, generative AI is really used for learning assistance more than information retrieval. It helps you to think, and then the information retrieval gives you what to think about and the information retrieval comes from searches. So they have two different purposes, which is why you can't use just one. Um, you could just use the search engines, but for um, a richer experience in your research, I believe it is appropriate to use both. So generative AI can help you refine your question. While search engines just offer you search term alternatives, and some don't offer that. Um, search engines are better for diverse content types. So I know when I'm doing a search in Google and it's using AI to help with the search, I'm going to get journal articles and news and blogs and videos and images, all of those things that it will tell me what they are and it will link me to those things. So it is information retrieval at its finest. Um, and generative AI can't do that, of course, but it can help you brainstorm and um, figure out some things that maybe you missed when you were thinking about your topic. And hybrid search engines, because it combines both, it doesn't combine them in one search, but remember it bundles them together. It offers the promise, the best of both worlds, but it does have the problems um, from each. So the issues with bias, the issues with over-reliance on our part, the issues with um, not knowing where data is coming from, um, or being overloaded with data, those are all still inherent in the hybrid search engines. So I'm going to give you a second to take a look at this. These are the skills needed to use specifically generative AI in an effective way. You need to be able to both recognize and evaluate the quality and relevance of information that you get. Because remember, it's not thinking. It's giving you a reflection of your question from the patterns it can create using the data that it covers. You must, must cross-check and verify facts. This is why you always have to do your database searching. You always have to do your journal article searching. You always have to do your primary source searching. Be careful in how you're qu framing your question. The more information you give a search engine, the more apt you will be to get information that is not useful because you're confusing it. You're giving it too much information. You just need the key terms. But in generative AI, the more specific and better crafted your question, the easier it is for the generative AI to find the pattern and match it. You have to understand <coughs> that the data in generative AI is based on patterns. It may not be current. It has limitations and it includes biases inherent within its data. Cite, no matter where you get your information, you must give credit to the people, beings, and others from which you got it. Because anytime you're using someone else or something else's work, you need to make note of that. 
You need to be flexible and rephrase things, reiterate um, as you're using ChatGPT or any other generative AI. A basic understanding of the strengths and limits of AI help make you a better user of the tool. That doesn't mean you need to know how to code it. It means that you need to know when it's giving you things, where those things are coming from, and the problems there might be with them, which leads to being aware of those biases. Um, and you need to check your own biases. We need to check our biases as well as the biases of the information that we're getting because psychologically we tend to search until we find the first thing we agree with and then we stop searching. But here's a note from a reference librarian's perspective. We are not doing research to write a paper. That sounds counterintuitive. Why else would you be doing it? You're doing research to understand a topic. And when you can understand a topic, then you can write a paper or make a presentation. So you hopefully will be doing more research than needed, more research than the bare minimum, because you want to understand what you're doing, you understand what you're saying, you understand what you're presenting. Um, and if you don't go outside your box, then you only have a limited understanding of your topic. And the more that you are aware of viewpoints that are different than yours, even that disagree with yours, the stronger your understanding is of that topic and the better you can write about it or present it. AI is evolving constantly. There's, it's a full-time job to keep up with it, but what you can do is once you pick some tools that you're comfortable with, keep up with what's going on in those tools. Maybe the date has changed. Maybe the data sets have changed. Maybe there's a new tool that's been integrated into it. Be aware of these things as they're happening. And um, beware of your time. Give yourself lots of time to do your research because the generative AI part of your research is only the beginning. The bulk of your research will still be looking for primary resources, looking for current news, looking for journal articles to clarify and back up what you're presenting. Um, so it's a good start, um, but it's not a shortcut. One more caveat with ChatGPT or any generative AI. Everything that you put into it is now public and importantly, adds to its data set. There have been cases when people forgot they were talking to a computer, gave it their phone number, and their phone number showed up in the answer to a stranger's question. So the computer doesn't understand the concept of privacy the way that humans do. It is simply looking for patterns across a whole bunch of data and giving anybody who has that pattern that content. Um, so not only can it give your private data away to other people, but it can give you false information because it doesn't understand the actual context of the information it's giving you. It's just giving you a pattern that matches your question. So I believe that these warnings are a little light <laughs> on ChatGPT. Um, I think that the very first one should be don't share sensitive information. The second one should be check your facts. And the third one is go ahead and ask. I think the warning should come before the invitation to just dive in and start playing. But I'm not their programmer. So here are some examples of how ChatGPT can be used depending on your field of study and your research instant interests. I already mentioned summarizing research papers. Um, this is a good way not to just use the summary, but to determine if it's worth the time to dig deeper into that um, journal article. It can generate alternative perspectives on a topic, which is really good when you're trying to get out of your box and you're not really sure how to get out of your box. So for example, I did a question to ChatGPT about wind turbines for power. And I said, give me the perspective on the advantages and disadvantages of using windmills to create power from the perspective of a landowner. And then after I got that answer, I asked it again. I said, that same question from the perspective of an environmental activist. And then I did the same question from the perspective of an investor. So I was able to get multiple perspectives based on the motivation of the individual using that information. It was really, really helpful. I use it a lot for brainstorming. 
because oftentimes I'll have a very large topic and I'm not necessarily sure what part I want to hone in on. And we'll, I'll show you this as an example later on in this presentation. It can be really good for generating outlines for putting information in a pattern because that's what it does. And outlines are patterns, right? And it lives to extract relevant information from large data sets. So that is absolutely what it does. Always follow your instructor's instructions regarding using AI in research. And if it's not clear or they don't have it laid out, ask them before you use it because you don't want to put all the work into it and then not be able to use it. So here's an example of brainstorming using ChatGPT 4.0. Sorry, 4. So you can use it to give a broad outline. So in this case, I asked, examine the causes and effects of global warming. That would be too big. So I give it a follow-up question included in the same query. What patterns do you notice and why might they exist? So it starts off with a short, this is what it is, definition. And then it breaks down in just what I asked, causes, effects, patterns. So it's following the pattern of my question when it gives me the response. So I can then read through that and say, wow, yeah, it's huge. What do I want to look at? Well, I live in an ocean community. So melting ice caps and rising sea levels, that could be something I would be very interested in. Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to it later. So some things that you need to do to verify the information that you find in ChatGPT. Always cross-reference from multiple sources, books, articles, authoritative and reputable websites, <coughs> to verify that that information is correct. And make sure that these sources are authoritative. Now, this could be because this person or this organization works in the field, um, has a PhD, they're attached to a research university, they're working on a study. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so authority can come in a number of guises, but it's people who know what they're talking about and can back that up. They don't just sound good and have lots of followers. They can actually back up their information. Check that it is recent and updated, especially, really especially for those that involve um, recent developments like medicine, technology, law, etc. Um, because there is a cutoff date for most generative AI. And beyond that, you have to use a hybrid or a search engine and evaluate the information yourself. Be especially conscious about facts and statistics. Try to find original sources for quotes if you can, because all too often quotes are used out of context and then they can be twisted to mean something completely different. In addition, because generative AI cannot connect content with container, it doesn't know where the information came from. Um, if you're quoting something and it says somebody, you know, this is a common thing to say, you don't know if it's common. Maybe they just saw it a lot of times. See if you can find out where the quote came from. Um, and always verify statistics. If you find a stat in one place or a fact in one place and you can never, cannot find it anywhere else, don't trust it. Because something that is a fact in only one place is an opinion. Think critically about everything that you look at. Question everything. Assess credibility. Recognize that it could be inaccurate. It could contain bias. It could contain a slant that you need to balance. Right? And one of the ways to help with this is to use academic databases. Santa Monica College has over 100 of them. Some are general. Some are specific. Some are on um, uh, discipline or a topic. Some have only journals. Some are videos. There's a little bit of everything there. Um, and JSTOR, EBSCO, ProQuest, and Gale are database publishers, and they have multiple databases that they publish. So check through them, and we have um, librarians available for to help with this. We also have videos on our YouTube channel on how to use specific databases and an introduction to research. So check those out, and always cite your sources. This promotes academic integrity and, importantly, allows others to verify the information that you came forward with. Because if there's an error in your paper, you want that error to have come because you cited something that it was incorrect, 
not because you didn't take the time to check something and so you made an incorrect assumption about it. I'll give you a moment to take a picture of this page. Professional fact checkers do something called lateral reading and that's in the news evaluation and website workshop online. Lateral reading is going outside of the source to find out about the source. And all of the professional che fact checkers at these sites do that. Um, I particularly like AP Fact Check. I also rather like Full Fact, but it tends to be more Europe-based and less US-based. And I liked factcheck.org. I like all of them, they're good, but those are the three that I tend to go to the most. Always check and verify. Look for original documents and use multiple sources. And I'll read this because it's important. At the end of the day, these systems still work by stringing words together in patterns that reflect the oceans of data fed to them. What they lack is a mental model of the world with all its complexities and nuance, which is necessary to properly interpret complex texts. They are likely to make big errors. That is not to say you shouldn't use them. You absolutely should. As with any tool, the more you use it, the better you get at using it, the better you are at identifying problems with it and using the strengths of it. And as you notice, I keep coming back to cite it because plagiarism is a bad thing. Okay. Always search for specific sources like journal and news articles. Cite those too. And here are those URLs from earlier. So going to the second half of this, as a Santa Monica College student, you have the entire office suite free for you to use. A lot of students use Google Docs. I have a problem with Google Docs partly for accessibility, but also partly because it's really difficult to format, especially your Works Cited page or your References page. and Office 365, Word specifically, is optimized to work really well with Canvas. It's easy to format, it's easy to use, it's free for you, and it's what instructors can use most easily when you upload assignments in Canvas. So I highly recommend um, that you go to this URL or just Google smc.edu Office for Students and it will take you here. And it takes you to a link for the page that you then log in. And with that, you get Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, um, a terabyte of cloud storage on OneDrive. You can set this up on several devices. You have access to it um, on your mobile device, on your phone or your laptop or your tablet. So for your own use, please do use Microsoft 365. Please do use Word. Which leads us to the AI-assisted search that I'm going to talk to you in more depth about, an application called Kenius. At this time, in October of 2023, we're the only college on the West Coast using Kenius. So if you have issues or questions with it, please do contact us through Ask a Librarian um, and let us uh, know, and then we will update the people so they can improve their app. It's really useful. Um, I use it to find journal articles, for example, for specific parts of my work. Um, and I also use it for cross-disciplinary research, but you can use it for a number of different things as listed on this slide. That's the why. This is the how. When you open Office 365 with your SMC student login, there is an icon up on the top to the right called Kenius Research Explorer. You simply click on that and it opens up a frame on the right that allows you to explore either by uploading a PDF or by opening a Word document and either pasting or typing in text in your Word document. So I'm going to use that second um, way. I took the information that I got from ChatGPT on climate change and I copied and pasted it in a document using Kenius, using Word. And then I said, of this, the part that I'm really interested in is melting ice and rising sea levels. So I highlighted that. And Kenius, over here on the side, I'm going to move this so you can see it, gave me articles about 
melting ice and rising sea levels. And it came up with over a thousand. So at that point, I need to be more specific and I need to limit it. How can I do that? There's a lot on this slide, so let me go bit at a time. You can filter by date, you can explore it by keyword, or you can go into topics. There are a number of different ways you can approach your search. Using the results that I already have, I can say climate change is a scientific topic and it has real world consequences that are very current. So I only want to go back the last three years. I'm going to go from 2020. Remember, this is being taped in October of 2023. And then I apply that. And the next results it would give me includes my highlighted area in my Word document and only the last three years or four years of articles. I can look through those. I can also search rather than by articles, I can search by topics. And what Kenius will do is it will go through all of the articles that it found and it will group them based on the topic it's primarily about. So most of them, of course, come up in environmental science. Some come up in oceanography, geology, geography, etc. Well, perhaps what I'm really interested in is climatology because I want to know more about the changes that are flooding the coast and are flooding low-lying islands. So it applied all of my current filters, so it's still using that highlighted text. It's still in the last three years, and then it's only the topic, only the articles that are relevant to the topic that I chose. So the two ways you can go in are by article or by topic. I personally like to go in with a date limiter, search within my results, and go by topic, and that gives me the most specific and um, defined set of results. So here's an example of what happens when I do that. Kenius has given me six citations that meet all of my requirements. I can then click on one and be careful at this point because at this point there's sometimes a failure in the process and it's not Kenius, it's actually the publishers of the articles. Sometimes the publishers code things in the metadata on the web as being open access, but they're actually a publisher who is trying to get you to pay for an article. So sometimes you'll get results here that are supposed to be open. When you actually get to the website, they want you to pay for it. At that point, I would back away quickly and pick a different article. Um, the reason for that is we have a lot of databases that you can access specifically that you are you're already covered. They're already paid for. You do not have to pay for articles. Wait until you're a grad student and then decide then whether you need to pay for food or pay for articles. We've all been there. Um, but not now. Don't do that now. You have too many other options first. So once you find an article that will open, sometimes it will go into our database and you click and it'll go through into one of our multiple databases. Sometimes it will be open access via the web and it will allow you to download the article for free. So that is how you can open a Word doc, use the brainstorming that you did in ChatGPT to search in Kenius, to go by date, specific part of your search, and topic to find a journal article. It sounds like a lot. When you're actually doing it, it flows organically and it's much quicker to do. And like with any tool, the more you do it, the more um, you get good at it, the faster and easier it becomes. Now that seems like a lot, but when you're doing research, that's only like the first half because you still have the databases to search. And I highly recommend that you search our databases for specific journal and news articles that are already paid for and free to you. On the library homepage, which you get by mousing over student support and then clicking on library, there are a number of ways you can search. If you are already deeply into your topic, I do not recommend a one search. I recommend that you go specifically into the databases button. We have at this point in October of 2023, 116 databases. They are also broken down by topic. You can search for databases here. Now there's a warning. When you are searching for databases, this is not a Google search that searches the content of all the databases. No, 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 no. 
This is a gateway search, which means it only searches these descriptions of all 116 databases. So I had a student who was looking for Andy Warhol. When they put Andy Warhol up here, they didn't get anything. But when they put art up here, they got like 13 to 15 databases. So search for the broad topic here that will be in the description of the database and then go into that database and search for the specific topic that you're looking for. Okay, it's kind of like going to the bookshelf, all the art books, and then you're looking for the specific book you want. Two searches, one for the database, one for the topic. And always as you're going, you have the option to talk with, chat with a librarian to get help. In most of our databases embedded in the interface, we actually have an Ask a Librarian along the side. Some databases like JSTOR don't allow us to do that yet. So you can always open two tabs, have JSTOR open in one, and then have the library homepage in the other so that you can ask a librarian via chat without losing your search. If you use Ask a Librarian during a time that we're open, you will talk to an SMC librarian unless we are teaching a class because the person doing the chat is also the person doing the orientations. Um, however, even if you don't get an SMC librarian, you will talk to a college or university librarian. We are part of an international consortium. Last Friday, in fact, I answered about a half a dozen questions from various people in different English and Scottish universities, <laughs> and I, I think I helped them all. Um, but you can ask a librarian at any time and you will talk to a human librarian at a college or university. If they cannot answer your question, they will do what's called a ticket and they will send us the transcript along with uh, clarifying information and as soon as we are open again we will get to that ticket and we will answer you ourselves. So ask us if you are unsure. This database may have been assigned to you or given to you as an extra credit opportunity so my name is Bren Antrim it's on the first slide and the keyword that is the code to say I watched this all the way through is brainstorm because that is often how AI makes me feel like I'm having a thunderstorm in my head. And then I wanted to leave you with some options of other things to look at, some news in order to keep up to date with what's going on with AI. Mozilla is a nonprofit foundation that um, does many, many things, but one of the things that it does is what's called insights, and it's very helpful. It has a lot of good stuff on AI. Both Harvard and MIT have AI sites that are useful for keeping up with information. And I also like Data and Society, which uh, talks about the overlap of AI and the society that is using it, um, not necessarily a perspective that you get from other resources, and it's one that I like. So if you have any questions, ask a librarian, and I hope that you found this um, workshop useful. Um, Good luck with your research.